all sorts of opportunities with the local chapter as well as OWASP Global. Um, there's AppSec projects to get involved in, volunteer opportunities, all that good stuff. Uh, here are our links. Um, what I tell people is, rather than write all these things down, uh, just go to your favorite search engine. Yeah, you don't need to take a picture of this. <laughs> go to your favorite search engine, type in OWASP MSP. These will be the first links that come up. One time the algorithm does work. <laughs> Um, membership is, of course, not required to come to these meetings and listen to these awesome talk, uh, speakers that we have. Um, but if you want to support the cause, uh, there's many different levels of membership. And those are the links to get to that. Don't talk to us. We don't have the money here. Um, you get credit, uh, CPEs, for uh, whatever certs uh, you have uh, to your names, uh, just for showing up to these chapter meetings. And participating, and you also get CPEs for giving a talk if you'd like. And uh, I'd like to throw it open if there are any employment opportunities that anybody know about uh, at their companies or if anybody's looking for an opportunity. Yes? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm new to the, the chapter here, um, new to the industry as a whole. I'm, I'm Luke, nice to meet everybody. Uh, looking for work, so if somebody does have an opportunity, that'd be great. What are you interested in? Um, application security, that okay. is, is one of them. Yeah, that and probably GRC, like compliance and legal kind of stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. there's, there's always need for that. Right. Okay, um, yeah, so if anybody has an opening. Oh, yes. Yeah, my name is Ron. I've been practicing software development for the past decade. So I experiment with different programming languages and I contribute also open sources. I do have my own open source as well to generalize utilities for Node, uh, for Node.js or API. So any application, uh, maybe technical applications if you have an open source, I'd like to contribute. I'd rather contribute to someone that can you know, be in the same state so you can have that experience you know, working with people, not online, but in person. So okay. I, do have, I, I don't think I do have Technology limitations now, it seems like I can say that I'm uh, programming agnostics because I'm just doing part time engineering now, a, a, a software uh, uh, development, uh, uh, computer science degree in uh, uh, Western Government University. So they use, they come up with different tools, and I was, I, I, it wasn't a problem, problem, problem uh, to me anymore. You know, the limitations of that, it's all about syntax and all that. So I think I can contribute to that. So if there is any software development and testing also, sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, actually, if you go out to wasp.org, they have a list of all the projects <coughs> that, that are under the OWASP umbrella. And uh, I, I know most of those, probably all of the projects you'll find out there, I mean, they're all open source. Uh, they, they always need help in one form or another, whether it's testing or yeah. helping code or write documentation or you know anything you could have an interest in. Um, I'm sure you can find something out there. Uh, I don't know how many of them are local. Um, I don't know of any of them that are local to the Twin Cities uh, offhand, but there might be. And anyway, it's a, it's a good place to get started. Okay. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Um, but now, if you're ready, <laughs> let me introduce Ryan Wakem. Uh, He's a senior solutions engineer at Checkmarks, and uh, would you like to give your own? Uh, yeah, I can. I can just okay. casual yeah. intro. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm a solutions engineer at Checkmarks, so sort of sales engineer in short. Um, been with Checkmarks for about three years, a little over three years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 15 years, uh, I'm, I'm local, spent 15 years at a offensive security company um, doing testing, consulting, program consulting, management, all sorts of fun stuff like that. So um, I'm reasonably technical. I'm not a developer. Um, I'm not like super pen tester or anything like that. Definitely not like uh, like some people today. But um, and yeah, I'm at, I'm at check marks and just, um, I'm not going to talk much about check marks other than to note um, a lot of this comes, and I'll actually I'll, I'll get to that because I have a slide on that. So what we're going to talk about today: software supply chain, um, 
Attacks in the software supply chain, AI and open source models, how to attack AI models, and then sort of some takeaways there. And sort of before I get going, credit where credit's due, right? Um, most of the content in this presentation was actually created by this guy, uh, Joseph Kadori. He is one of the leaders of the Checkmarks uh, research team. So Checkmarks is an AppSec solutions uh, AppSec testing solutions company, right? We sell AppSec, AppSec testing solutions. We also have a research team of close to 100 people, um, pretty involved in the community. Uh, you know, that supports a lot of the business, but they're also, you know, they publish a lot. Um, actually, the, the head of our entire research team, um, very involved in OWASP, I think maybe a board member um, at like the global level. Um, he also was one of the people who put together and continues to put together like the top 10 API, API top 10. So um, some pretty legitimate uh, security research uh, kind of capabilities at the company. And a lot of the focus uh, of the team is on specifically open source related risks. And so uh, frankly, I'm stealing most of Joseph's content. I tweaked it a little bit, I shortened it. Um, but yeah, so thanks Joseph. And he has, um, at, the, at the very, you can read Either Checkmark's blog has a bunch of stuff, his medium has a bunch of stuff. There's actually a Checkmark, the, the Checkmark's research team has a sort of a medium as well. There's a link to or a URL, URL for that uh, at the end. But if you're interested in this stuff, there's these guys are, are, are top notch. So, um, software supply chain. So, typical software supply chain sort of involves right, developing source code, manage, managing it in some sort of version control. Uh, building and testing the code, right, through CICD, um, preparing it for distribution, deploying it to the end users, sort of from a life cycle perspective, right, this includes things like, you know, continuous maintenance, updates, patches, etc. Now, um, you know, your, 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 your software supply chain may, you know, vary a little bit, um, but the key thing here is that there's the potential for vulnerabilities tampering disruptions at many stage of these processes, of, of this process, right? And that can ultimately lead to compromised software integrity, uh, security breaches, operational failures, etc. Now, uh, who, it, is anyone here familiar with Salsa, S-L-S-A? No, okay, so Salsa is supply chain levels for software artifacts. It's um, a framework really designed to ensure the integrity and security of software supply chains. So it's sort of an industry, I don't know, initiative, right? Like some of the big companies, the Googles, the Microsoft, similar, um, come together to put this together. Um, they have sort of a, the concept of a, a framework with different levels of security around your supply chain process. There's like L0, which is we don't know what supply chain is, and then there's through L3 today, which is, you know, hey, it's, you know, you, you can sort of, at some level, attest to the security of the processes and, and it doesn't necessarily take at this point, I mean it's a couple of years old I guess, um, doesn't necessarily cover everything but that's kind of the idea, right? Just recognizing that, you know, if you think of AppSec, maybe historically you think, oh, source code or, you know, application code that has flaws in it. Well, yeah, but they're actually, you know, that's here. <laughs> That's A, basically, and we have now all the way through H, just in this diagram, where there are other sort of areas, there are other parts of that process where some sort of security failure, if you want to think of it that way, can be introduced. Um, so in this case, right, we're really going to be focused on E uh, today. So threats to dependencies, specifically open source, right? So think your open source components, your um, your stuff on GitHub or NPM or whatever it may be. So, just so I kind of understand who is in the room, who, who's like kind of developer, any, any developers, a couple developers, like AppSec specific, like engineers, anyone? Just more broadly security people. Okay, cool. So, I guess who uses open source components? Well, Everyone uses open source components, right? Um, and, and that's right, the, the key, right? Someone already built the thing, maybe, that you want to use, so why are you going to recreate it from scratch? Um, and so really, what developers are looking for is, hey, I need this package that does the thing that I, that I, that I want, right? Why am I going to spend hours, days, 
writing a component when I can literally download it and drop it into my, into my project, right? So, hey, we need, the, we need a package that does this thing. What developers are not necessarily asking for is a package that is made up of a bunch of other packages. But the reality is, just like you use open source software, <laughs> developers of open source software also use open source software. So, when you get a package, right, uh, you, you go to whatever, NPM, and you're like, I need this JavaScript package. Well, chances are, there's a whole tree of dependencies behind it. And, you know, we have a, a solution that, that does some of this dependency resolution and, and, and reporting, but it's sometimes amazing how you can have, you know, an application with like 10 what we call direct dependencies. That means the developer intentionally included these 10 components, right, third-party packages. And then the total transcript, right, all of these other ones, there's like a thousand. Especially like JavaScript. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and the key here is, Every single one of these is a potential weak spot, right? Mm. Try not to be too, too negative about that, but the reality is you can kind of get attacked at every step in the process. And so just to kind of illustrate this, right, we look at NPM, hey, we want to install a particular package. We got 811 packages from 611 contributors, right? That's a lot for, for one, you know, sort of one, one key package. So, just some key sort of statistics or things to think about here. Um, software supply chain attacks have grown, I don't know, 742, I don't know where I got this number. Like, thanks, Joseph. All of our 750% <laughs> over the last couple of years, right? And ballpark half of global organizations will experience some sort of software supply chain attack um, you know, by next year. So this is a, this is a real thing. Um, so let's talk about some of the more well-known software supply chain attacks. I guess question before I jump in. Does any of this kind of ring true? Does, have any of you heard about like any software supply chain attacks or specifically like open source, um, not open source vulnerabilities because just like, you know, if you're a developer, you can write code that has security flaws and you don't want to admit that, but I, I certainly can. I'm a, I'm a terrible developer. Um, but you know, the developers of open source software, same thing, right? They make mistakes, introduce security flaws. That's different, right? We think about that as like a security flaw of vulnerability, right? Not something that was intentionally introduced. Um, here we're talking about something a little bit different. So has anyone actually heard of any of these um, sort of scenarios? And if not, I'll introduce you to some of the some of the, the more common ones. So meet, meet Faisal, he's from Indonesia. Um, and he is actually the author or main contributor of this uh, UA parser JavaScript library. Um, it basically abstracts away user agent detection. That's kind of irrelevant. He's maintained it for a long time, for 10 years, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty old. Um, it's very popular, 10 million weekly downloads, plus or minus. Um, but on October 5th, of a few years ago, uh, there was a post made in a prominent uh, Russian hacking forum offering to sell access to a developer account of some undisclosed package on basically NPM, right? So it didn't specify what pack or, or what developer this was or what the developer account had access to. Does note, seven million installations, more than seven million installations every week um, more than a thousand others are dependent on this. No two-factor authentication. Um, okay. So, while there's no direct evidence, no one is that I'm aware of, that Faisal's account was the one that was actually referenced in the post. A couple weeks later, on October 22nd, there was a security alert that was published regarding malicious code having been discovered in UA parser, right? And so there are actually three versions of the package that were impacted, right? So the, the, the scenario, the suspicion, is that Faisal's account was compromised and these three versions of the um, UA parser uh, package were actually um, sort of poisoned, if you will. And by reviewing commits, uh, it was determined that the infected versions would actually install a crypto miner on victim systems, specifically uh, turning the victim systems into a node to mine Monero, which is a token, right? You can actually see, you can kind of see pool.mine at XMR, 
right? So it's basically what this does is it basically starts up a, a crypto miner. And you know, if you have five of these, that's one thing. If you have five hundred thousand, you know, maybe you can turn it into a little bank. Um, so that was the idea here. We have basically an account takeover, right? Faisal was sort of a victim in this whole thing. Yeah, he probably could have had some better security practices, two-factor authentication and things like that. Um, but his account was leveraged to turn this uh, UA parser into literal malware, right? And that's one of the big dangers, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. <laughs> All right, a little bit of a different, uh, different flavor here. Meet Brandon. Brandon rides motorcycles, specifically electric motorcycles. I guess he races. He's also a software developer. Um, and he maintains the Node IPC project, like an inter-process communication package. He's maintained it for some time, eight years. So pretty, you know, pretty decent. Not quite as popular as uh, UA Parser, but he gets a million weekly downloads, which is not too shabby. Um, a couple of years ago, on March 7th, he added some new functionality uh, to the uh, to, to his his pet project. Now. It's somewhat obfuscated. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on here. But if we kind of de-obfuscate it, we start to see some interesting things. There's some geolocation going on. There's some reference down here to Russia or Belarus. And we can kind of see the start of hmm, delete file, delete file, delete file, delete file. Okay. So, um, oh, I spoiled it. Okay, right, geolocation, right, figure out where you are. Um, hey, if you're in Russia or you're in Belarus, we're gonna start deleting your files. Um, and leave a nice little love, love letter uh, with a heart um, on your hard drive. So what's this all about? Uh, well, if you recall a few years ago, there was the beginning of, a, of an invasion of the Ukraine uh, by Russia and Brandon was disturbed by this. And so he was, I guess, the first to create what we now call protest wear. The idea being he has a large following. He has some sort of, I don't know, power, influence, something. Um, and so he takes his tool, intentionally turns it into some sort of malware, and goes on a rant on the internet. Um, there we go. Protest wear. Um, it has since been corrected. You can download uh, good versions of Node IPC. All right, meet Andres. He's a software developer. He actually contributes to PostgreSQL. He also happens to be an engineer at Microsoft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, earlier this year, just a couple months ago, he was running some performance tests and he noticed something was a little bit off, right? A, oh. usually they're fast, now something's slow, what's going on, right? This is weird. Well, he's an engineer, so he wasn't just gonna let it go, right? He's gonna figure out what's going on. So he investigates, and a few days later, he kind of comes out of his, his investigative, investigatorial hole um, and sort of notifies the community that he's basically found a backdoor in the XC package. So he makes some posts, he says, hey, I found out that this, this thing has been backdoored. So XE is actually a data compression utility. It's used by a lot of things, like Debian Linux and all sorts of other things. Um, and so this, once again, kind of trying to put the pieces together, you know, no one necessarily always, there's, there's not, you know, you can't go one place and figure out exactly what happened. But a lot of the researchers who tried to track this thing down kind of found there was this, uh, user account on GitHub that was created, GAT75, over time, sort of built uh, reputation, actually becomes a contributor, sort of insinuates in her itself into this XE project and becomes an official contributor. And this is over the course of years. Uh, actually publishes uh, malicious versions Victim installs malicious release, and then it basically does that thing. A question? Yeah. Is there anybody that, or is there any control over who is allowed to be an official contributor 
Is there a review? Is there, I mean, this seems like the, the ultimate yeah. failure of open source. Right, and, and I think, you know, that is both the strength and the weakness of open source software, right? Anyone can contribute, right? We, can, we have a massive community of developers who can contribute their extra time, their passion to build these things. On the flip side of that coin, we have probably not as massive, but an equally motivated number of attackers um, who want to, you know, inject malware, disrupt, whatever it may be. Um, well, I, I don't necessarily um, directly address that question. So, to my knowledge, generally, no. There are probably repositories. Um, or you know, package managers or things like that where there is, are tighter controls. Um, something like a GitHub, right? Someone has to give you access to become a contributor. So that's why in this case, it's kind of interesting that you know, this, this, well, <laughs> this user account, we'll refer to it as a user account, um, you know, in 2021 was created and then starts solely contributing to sort of build the reputation before actually sort of attacking, right? And so in that case, it's tough, right? I don't know, maybe you only trust the people you've met, maybe you only trust the people you've worked with. Um, it, that, that, that's a tough one, uh, no question. Well, you, you can see there are multiple fake profiles, so we created other fake profiles to pressure yep. the owner. Exactly. Of, you know, yeah, so I mean, this, this is a technical attack, there were social engineering aspects here, um, what it really comes down to is it was actually extremely advanced, and a lot of people think that this is a nation state type act. Um, don't know, but um, certainly, certainly, um, you know, sort of involvement of multiple identities, the complexity of the actual payload, the level of the technical sort of knowledge or expertise that was required, um, the timeline, right? Who spends three years? Trying to back the or a open source are too lazy. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, there's no immediate, you know, yeah. I immediate pay that you know pay, right? Like this kind of aligns with your typical advanced persistent threat, i.e., nation state, right? Um, and this is actually part of a somewhat growing um, trend of sort of um, APTs, nation states, whatever you want to think of them as, sort of targeting these key open source projects, right? So the question about you know. So how do you secure this? Well, I don't necessarily have an answer. There is no current answer. We'll touch on some of the takeaways at the end, um, but it is it is a, a real problem. And, and some of these are those small, tiny things that you include. Right. It's, exactly. not, it's not the package you want. That's something. Way exactly. Better. Exactly. You know. You right. If you're able to put your little back door yeah. somewhere way down the supply chain, and it kind of rolls its way up, you, you, you know, it could be a lot of things. So I'm going to touch. Um, Slide. No, um, I'm going to touch a little bit about on a couple of the other maybe common techniques that we've seen uh, around uh, you know sort of malicious packages. So one is dependency confusion. Um, these will be fairly brief. So dependency confusion basically exploits a vulnerability in the way that a lot of package managers actually download dependencies during a build, right? So often. Um, well, the, the idea behind the dependency uh, confusion sort of approach is the attacker uses a specific package name of something that may be an internal package at like a company uh, at their target and then publishes a malicious package on a public repository with the same name but a higher version number. And often, and this varies, it depends on the specifics of the technology that you're using, but often your package manager will see that, see the internal package, and go out and grab the higher version number, right? Hey, you have version 1.2.3 in your local repository, version 5000 is available from whatever, your, your public repository, I'm gonna grab that, right? Um, so certainly there are some solutions that are starting to incorporate this, starting to manage, you know, limit, um, I mean, JFrog in particular, I don't work for JFrog, but you know, there are some tools that they have to essentially limit, to sort of build an internal library and say, hey, developers or architects, here are the packages that you're allowed to use. Anything that comes in has to be vetted, right? And their process is for vetting that to make sure that 
or at least to the degree possible, that they are you know, legitimate clean packages, not malware. Well, that brings up a whole, whole uh, another question. Now, now the company is taking onto itself the vetting of potentially right. all the contributors to all the packages yep. and the dependencies of that package. Yeah, and it's an impossible task. It's, it's, yes, it's, it's very challenging, and without talking too much about it, um, that's actually a lot of what our, our research team does, is part of our solution is intended to identify or help identify malicious third-party packages, right? A, a sliver of it. And a lot of the work that is required to enable that is manual effort, right? It's people going out, doing the investigation, looking at the packages. I mean, they've got a whole process. It's it's obviously heavily automated, but there are manual there are manual parts, and they've I don't know they review hundreds of thousands, probably millions of open source packages every year, right, to identify these, and they find a lot. Um, but it's a combination of you know running the actual you know the, the the software, right, seeing what it does, monitoring for network traffic, local you know file system traffic. Is it reaching out to some weird IP address that shouldn't be? Um, also, contributor reputation, right? Does this contributor have, you know, a, a long history of contributing to legitimate projects, or is it someone who just popped up? Or in some cases, they found a contributor, you know, I, mean, I don't know why you do this, but, you know, a contributor has published a bunch of malicious packages on one repository, then goes to the next one, and guess what? You know, same username or whatever. It doesn't <laughs> seem very smart, but, um, you know, even criminals, well, a lot of criminals make, make silly mistakes. Um, okay, uh, another common technique, uh, starjacking. So GitHub statistics in particular, uh, specifically stars, really one of the common sort of measures of a package's popularity, right? You go to GitHub and you're like, oh, show me the things that are most popular, right? The things that have a lot of stars. Um, one of the issues with this is package managers like your Grand PM, your PyPies, you know, whatever it may be, they often don't validate the statistics of the package. So if you think about it, often the way it works is GitHub will be where the contributors actually build their project, right? Their open source package. But they, while it may be published there, it's often published into some other package manager repository, right? So NPM, right, you've got your JavaScript package. People can manually download it from GitHub, but if they put it posted on NPM, then it can be automated. Right, and through that build process. So part of the issue is the connection between the package manager and the actual, in this case, GitHub, is not validated, right? So one example, PyPy for Python, um, when contributors link a package, right, you, it, it'll actually pull into the GitHub statistics. Hey, here's how many stars, how many forks, right? Hey, this looks like a popular package, right? You can get this from PyPy uh, if you just look up the pack package information. Um, However, the way that this is actually built, the configuration file for the package uh, page is actually created manually. So, and they, there's, this is the, from literally the tutorial on how to create this. And they literally say, you can update you know, the name field, don't change the other fields, right? So it's like it automatically generates a, a, a sample or a default um, uh, configuration, and then you have to go in and like tweak a couple of things. Hey, I'm gonna change the name. Well, it says, yeah, don't change the URL. That's the, that's, that points at, you know, GitHub or whatever. Well, guess what? You can literally go in, you can manually change the URL and have it point to a different legitimate package that has all of the, you know, positive reputation that you want. So you can go in, you can say, I want my, my project to have, you know, 10,000 stars or whatever, and you find one that you actually want to sort of masquerade as, drop that link in, you're off to races. Okay, this is a good one too. Typo squatting. Um, a lot of people have heard of typo squatting in the in the sense of like, especially earlier, earlier, God, I don't know, fifteen years ago, um, in like domain name squatting, right? Or hey, I'm gonna, I'm you know, we know Google, so I'm gonna buy Google with three O's and make it you know, whatever something that people don't want to see, malware, whatever it may be, right? So you name your malicious package a common misspelling or typo, right? Now. This is one of this is this is one of my favorites um, because it's so simple. So moment uh, JavaScript package. Now 
since I've started talking about Moment, um, they released a couple new versions and they're now a legacy project. So this is what the web, if you go to NPM search for Moment, this is what you're gonna see. However, it used to look a little bit more like this. It had, no, uh, sorry, this is 2.29.1, right? 2.30.1, 2.29.1, still has the old, uh, or sorry, the new um, status. Uh, you can see, gets like 20 million downloads a week, very popular. Um, but it used to look more like this, <laughs> right? So this is, hey, it's the actual description, but if you look, here a moment, 265 weekly downloads, mom net, right? So this is, a typo squatting of moment and at one point before moment actually sort of became a legacy package it looked exactly the same the only way that you could tell essentially was it said mom net not moment and the number of downloads was suspiciously low now the crazy thing if you ask me now this was actually malware right it's got I don't know I don't know I think it did some sort of deletion of the application so if you include this as part of your application, and it runs, it'll actually delete a bunch of HTML out of your app or something like that. <laughs> the crazy thing is I've been talking about this malicious package stuff for two and a half years using this example. I took the screenshot this morning. It's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why, you know, the, the versions don't match up, right? At one point, my, you know, when I did this, the versions matched up, and it was a, a carbon copy, but yeah, so it's kind of crazy. It's still available for download. And, I mean, admittedly, <laughs> Really, I haven't done it either. There, there actually down here is a button that says like report malware, so <laughs> go figure. Okay, um, so we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit, talk a little bit about AI and open source models. So out of curiosity, um, I think last year and a half has been interesting uh, around, you know, Gen AI and kind of everything that it's, that it's, you know, all the possibilities that maybe it has introduced, also all of the challenges that it's introduced. Um, who, does anyone work for a company that is like super on board, we're 100% going AI, AI tool, we're giving our developers, you know, co-pilot or whatever, or doing all that stuff, or kind of like wishy-washy, haven't quite decided, we're, you've got like some review boards trying to figure out what the heck to do about AI, or you're just like shutting it down, we're not going to do it, which is not going to work. <laughs> some, some combination there, yeah? Yeah, I mean, you're completely diving deep into it, so we just approved our developers to use the co-pilot. There you go. And, and see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, most of the customers that I talk to are in the we're trying to figure it out phase, right? They recognize they probably aren't going to be able to completely forbid it, because someone's going to go out there and use it anyway, and then you're just kind of in a worst case if you're just sticking your head in the sand. Um, at the same time, uh, they're being cautious, the customers that I work with tend to be very large and they, many of them are pretty risk averse to begin with, so that's part of it. Most of them at some point will likely internalize an AI model, which is, we'll talk about that <laughs> or why in, in, a, in a couple minutes, um, but they're not going to be going out using you know, public anything. It's going to be our internal LLM that maybe is trained on their internal specific data, so it's better, gives them better results for what they need, and also they can manage sort of what's going on there. So, November 30th, 2022, ChatGPT was released as a prototype. It's the fastest road to 100 million users. It took two months for ChatGPT to get 100 million users. It took Netflix 18 years. <clears throat> so we, we actually had a, a, a survey that we did of some customers um, kind of asking you know, do you currently use AI tools in your development process? 44% said yes. Um, that's pretty high, actually. 30% said no, I don't plan to, and 26% said no, but I plan to soon. Um, if you actually ask developers specifically how favorable is your stance on using AI tools, almost everyone was, well, three quarters was pretty favorable, which isn't a big surprise. This is a, a different survey that Check marks that was not involved in. How similar or different do you anticipate your workflow to be in one year um, as a result of AI? And really the important thing is 
This is the neither different nor similar. This is the different. This is the, it's going to be the same. So very few people think that it's not going to change. Right? These things are not going to change. Um, well, we already know it's here, right? You can already get Copilot and others in your IDE. Um, I've played with it some, do this thing. It's kind of cool. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but how, how, do we, how do we think about AI models from a security standpoint? So the first thing is um, sort of garbage in, garbage out, right? Has anyone heard of AI hallucinations or familiar with that term? Yes. So many of the models, and I kind of alluded to this a minute ago when I talked about internal models, right? Many models are trained on the internet, so we should have low expectations. <laughs> And I think someone may have kind of made a reference to this earlier, uh, just not that long ago, right? A few weeks ago, Google sort of flipped on their AI overview for their search results, and I think things could have gone a little better. Um, and these were all over, you know, wherever you, you get your, your key tech news from, right? Uh, how do I make my cheese not slide off my pizza? Um, add glue. You can add glue, you can thicken the sauce. And then you can also try adding an eighth of a cup of Elmer's glue for extra tackiness. Okay. My, my favorite in that was uh, the application of tourniquets for head wounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, parachutes are no more effective than backpacks at preventing death or major injury when jumping from an aircraft. <laughs> uh, is it okay to leave a dog in a hot car? Yes. I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm feeling depressed, jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, that's not a great recommendation. How many rocks should I eat? You should eat, uh, according to geologists at UC Berkeley, you should eat at least one small rock per head. <laughs> right, you get the idea. Um, can I use gasoline to cook spaghetti? No, you can't use gasoline to cook spaghetti fast, right? You can use gasoline to make a spicy spaghetti. <laughs> right? So. The idea here is large language models can often lead to fascinating instances of hallucination, right? Where the model basically generates or, you know, creates these somewhat creative, but I think unexpected responses, right? And they may or may not align with actual factual reality that at least humans live in. Um, so, I, sorry, I gotta yeah. say, the, the one about jumping off the plane, that is a real study. They <laughs> jump like like two or three feet off. The there you go, right? Right, so where, what is the source of your data? Like these are all, this, there are different levels of AI hallucination. And the problem, one of the challenges with these Gen AI models is they're kind of black boxes. No one, no one, I mean maybe someone can, can figure out or knows, but even to some degree the creators don't necessarily, they can't necessarily trace out where this, why did we get this specific response? based on this input, right? Um, and so it all came from somewhere, but sometimes the source is not that good, right? Um, and that's the scary part, is that there's one website out there where some geologist said, that right. you must eat one. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of training, um, but because of that, it, it's, it's, about, it's a question of what are you training your model on, right? Um, so, whatever, we end up generating these theoretically plausible, but, you know, not really realistic responses or good responses. So, there's a Stanford research paper uh, that was published, you can Google, it was actually called Do Users Write More Insecure Code with AI Assistants? Participants who had access to an AI assistant were more likely to introduce vulnerabilities for the majority of their programming tasks. They also were more likely to rate their insecure answers as secure mm -hmm. compared to the control group. So basically, participants who trusted the AI less and engaged more with the language and format of their prompts provided code with fewer security vulnerabilities. So in short, AI makes you a less secure programmer. At least that's where we are today. Um, so that's one of the issues kind of with garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, especially for software development models, right? And maybe they're not trained on secure code, so you know you get what you know. You kind of question. Yeah. Um, these insecurities um, are these just simply hallucinations, or are we beginning to see um, at 
adversaries populating the models such that Hold they that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that thought. I'll get to it in just a sec. Yeah. Um, but before, before we get to that, um, this is an interesting one. So talking about AI hallucinations. And, and to some degree, these many of these relate to AI hallucinations. It kind of depends on what you mean. Is it because someone's intentionally poisoned it? Is it because it just comes from somewhere that no one knows? Right? That's part of the question. But here's, here's a good one. So um, you have an attacker. The attacker goes to whatever, their, their lang large language model and asks, hey, you know, write me this, right? give me source code with a bunch of open source packages that, I don't know, creates a tic-tac-toe game, right? And chat GPT or whatever it is responds, and one of the packages or open source components that it recommends doesn't actually exist. So the attacker recognizes this, and he doesn't go and fix it. He publishes that package as malware. So then a legitimate user comes along, asks a question, and guess what? The model responds with, use that package. Well, now that package exists, and the user can actually go out, grab that malicious package, install it, as the AI told me to, and now has somehow compromised their system, application, whatever, right? So this is one way that we've actually seen um, sort of people figure out some of the weaknesses in these models, right? Some of these hallucinations that are, are made and start to leverage them, right? Um, along similar lines, model poisoning, right? So models can basically be poisoned when they're trained on not just bad, but intentionally malicious data, right? And there are a couple kind of different flavors here that these are all, all have kind of overlapping similarities, but hey, you've got your model, right? You train it on, on a specific data set, and the way it actually works is you train it, you refine it, you know, you, you evaluate it, you know, hey, is it doing what I want it to do? No, I'm gonna go back and tweak the model, I'm gonna train it some more, right? This is a very iterative process of tweaking the rules, and then eventually you get a trained model. Well, as you asked, what if the attacker can somehow poison the training data set, right? If we can create a lot of bad data, if we can put a lot of really bad code on, you know, GitHub, and then everyone trains their models on GitHub, for example, well, guess what, we'll probably get a lot of bad code. Uh, we end up with, you know, poison models. Somewhat similarly, um, you know, the attacker can actually take a legitimate trained model and basically add additional training to turn it into, kind of convert it into some sort of uh, poisoned model. And this starts to then overlap with malicious models. So is anyone familiar um, with Hugging Face? It's a great name. So Hugging Face is like sort of the GitHub of AI models. So it's, they claim to be the AI community building the future. So it's a platform where machine learning uh, professionals sort of the community collaborates on building models and data sets and applications and refining and everything. So one of the great things about Hugging Face is it allows users to clone you know, an existing model, refine it, modify it, you know, publish it, et cetera. But it can actually be exploited, which our research team did. It's pretty easy. They basically took a legitimate model, attacker or security researcher. They tweaked it, right? They basically created some malicious payloads. And hey, and, and, and the difference here kind of between poisoned and malicious in terms of terminology, poisoned basically the model is not going to provide good results, right? Maybe it's going to give specific type of bad results, right? Malicious code, vulnerable code, etc. Uh, in this case, this is a literal, a literal payload in the model. So the victim maybe installs it. I think in the case of our research team, it was actually a, a, uh, an IDE plugin and it installed and it can actually package malware itself. So it would actually be, you know, sort of a, a uh, compromise of the victim system. And they actually published it. They put a lot of disclaimers up there, but you know, they called it GPT-2RS. Says, don't run this, but you can actually go run it. Right? People did. <laughs> yeah, people do it. So, um, sort of some 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 takeaways here, right? Uh, how how do you kind of protect yourself broadly speaking? Because there are a lot of very specific, you know, hey, in this instance, don't do that or don't do that. Um, maybe don't be the first to install the latest version of everything. This is not a new concept, right? I mean, 
especially if you work in like large enterprise, they're like, we're never on the newest version of anything, right? And you're like, God, you guys are so far behind. Well, maybe it's because they're slow, or maybe it's because they're risk averse, and they want to make sure that everyone else falls victim to the problems before they do, right? So the idea here is, okay, if you update slowly, there may still be vulnerabilities, but hopefully someone's caught the supply chain risks by that point, right? Maybe. Um, just because a package or model is popular doesn't mean it's safe, right? There's legitimate popularity. First of all, there's no guarantee that just because everyone's doing it, it's a good idea. And I tell my kids that all the time, it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, but also we can sort of fake popularity, right? We can give our, our, uh, our, our you know, our project or our, our component on, you know, PyPy, like I showed, um, as many stars as we want. And, you know, there are tools being developed that provide some level of assurance, but they're by no means ubiquitous, right? These, this is a very early stages. And a lot of this, especially, I mean, the concept of malicious packages, kind of open source packages, in large part, I mean, that's four years old, four or five years old. Not to say that there was never a malicious package before that, but like when it kind of became a, a thing in you know, sort of in vogue, I guess. Um, AI models, obviously, that's brand new, right? So the ability to identify these things is, is definitely new. Um, there are solutions that are being developed. Um, those solutions are always going to, or hopefully going to improve. But, you know, just like your mom told you, don't take code from strangers. So that wraps it up. Um, the one uh, sort of thing I'll note is this is our research teams. Uh, it actually just goes to their medium. Um, a lot of really interesting stuff. Do a, a fantastic job. Uh, they got stuff, little videos on YouTube, they publish all over the place. Um, really top notch. And so thanks to them for putting together the vast majority of this presentation. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Not that I can answer them, but I will try. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned the, the salsa at the beginning. Yeah. That's more of a standard that's already out there for like the whole supply chain type stuff. Yeah, so so, so Salsa, the core concept of Salsa is that it provides a framework for sort of measuring and I don't want to say certifying, but um, you know, scoring, um, sort of, I guess measuring the level of security assurance in the supply chain, right? And so that, so like for example, uh, and I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since I looked at it, like level zero is nothing, um, or maybe like your, your build your builds are being done like on your developer's laptop, right? Versus your builds are being done on an actual server that is secured at some level, or you actually know what's going into your builds, right? You have done some security validation of the process, right? And that, that is sort of the different levels. Salsa is, it's a few years old. Um, is that something like Artifactory that's already implementing it? So Salsa is just kind of an organization and a framework, um, kind of like OWASP, just a different focus. Um, something like Artifactory or, you know, like the JFrog or like Nexus, um, those are actually, that's a piece of software, right? Right, right? And in those cases, like I've kind of alluded to, um, there are many options for managing kind of what goes in if you want to. That introduces other challenges, scalability challenges and things like that. But that's, that's a way that some organizations I know are trying to handle that. But this also is like, it's like defining the scenario where like all the attack points are all across the supply chain. Right, right? yeah. But later you got into like AI stuff and there's no standard. No, so yeah, yeah, so so yeah, I, I kind of, yeah, so this is sort of two parts, right? We think open source from the perspective of the, the open source components like your GitHubs, your package managers, et cetera, that's where Salsa is more focused, right. um, sort of building of software and the processes, the tooling, and the security that's wrapped around that tooling um, and those processes. The second part, kind of the AI focus, is a little bit fo focused on um, open source AI models like in Hugging Face. Um, some of the risks have parallels, but yeah, two, they are two different things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is anyone developing uh, AI tools to analyze code for bugs, for insecurities, for 
uh, inserted code, etc. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I know that our that, that our researchers are spending time on that. Um, I don't know a whole lot of, about it, other than every now and then I see something cool come out. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I had no. I, I mean, I hope that that would be possible. I mean, just to give you an idea, right? We have an IDE plugin, and now we're able to feed it. Hey, like. Here's a specific scan, right? So we're, we do scanning, right? Provide a scanning solution, and hey, here's a result, right? Here's a SQL injection result. And it used to be that we would have to tell customers, basically, the guidance is this generic guidance, right? Or here's a generic example code. Now, sometimes with pretty good um, accuracy, you can hit the button, it goes out, you know, sends a prompt to some AI model, comes back with literally the source code that you can copy paste in. So not how do you fix a SQL injection, injection, how do you fix this one, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot, I can guarantee you a lot of work is being done on that. Now, how successful, how accurate will it be? What are the you know false positives versus false negatives? I don't know, I think that's gonna be a, a definitely a challenge. Um, but yeah, no doubt there's a, a lot of effort being put into that. And one of the biggest concerns there that you alluded to earlier is the fact that a lot of times you're going to have to push your source code to their cloud, to their servers, <clears throat> for them to analyze it in order to, you know, use their AI models on mm -hmm. it, and so you have to trust them with your, your PI. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, if anyone does have questions, feel free to. Um, and I guess I don't have my email up there. I'm pretty easy to to find. My name's on the. On the uh, on the website, right, with the, the information from the meetup, and I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm not very active on LinkedIn, but I'm there. Um, yeah, I highly encourage if you're interested in any of this stuff, check out the kind of the the, uh, the articles that the, that the research team publishes. Thank you. Thank you.